Uh, so today we have a, a standalone message. We completed our series last week. It was in the whole month of January, morning and evening, on a, a move of God. And that, that series is over, but we continue to seek after God. We continue to um, really covet his, his presence with us, not just in our services, but in our own lives, to see God move in our lives, guide us, lead us, uh, fill us with his presence, with his power, uh, just purpose and all of that, that that comes from a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But today, the message that I want to share with you is entitled, A Culture of Joy. A Culture of Joy. A few weeks ago, I shared a message in our Christmas series on a gift exchange on joy. And it was about exchanging our, our sorrow and our grief for joy. I believe that joy is something that we, we ought to have. And so as I talk about today, this culture of joy, what we are, are wanting, what we are hoping, we are kind of adopting this as a, as a, as a mission, as a, a motto that we are going to, at New Hope, be a culture of joy. And so I'm gonna explain that this morning, but I think what the world needs more than anything is joy. What we're missing in the world as we look around is joy. In that message that I shared uh, in December, talking about joy, we, we, we kind of saw that the world kind of defines happiness and joy the same. And I would challenge that joy is not the same as happiness. Because happiness has to do with what's happening around us. And so if my circumstances or my situation seem to be falling apart, not so happy. You know what I'm talking about. If everything's good and life is good and you've got your bills paid and you're able to do this and you're able to do that, it just causes us to be happy. But joy doesn't have to do with our circumstances. Joy has nothing to do with what's happening around me. Joy is constant because joy comes from the presence of God. The psalmist said, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. So where does joy come from? The presence of God. And so I don't think that the world can fully understand joy like we know it, like we can experience it as, as children of God. We have a, a, an opportunity to experience joy that says, you know what, no matter what my circumstances look like, I still know a God who hasn't changed. And I've lived long enough and seen God work in my life in other situations where when I'm in the midst of something and I think everything seems like it's falling apart, I have faith in a God who has come through and who promises that he will always be faithful. He won't ever leave me. He's always with me. He's working for my good. There are so many promises in Scripture that we can, that we can uh, hang on to to know that no matter what my circumstances, I may not feel so happy, but I can experience joy. There is a joy because I know that God is in control. I know that he is behind the scenes. I know that no matter what it looks like to me, he knows how to fix it. And I might try to fix it, might try to, and all I'm going to do is make a mess of things. There comes a point of just trusting God that he's taking care of our, our situation. But um, joy is a, is a word that is different than happiness. It's dependent on who Jesus is rather than what's happening around us. Psalmist also said, you have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and wine. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the importance of joy and us cultivating this culture of joy in our church. You're gonna see this phrase over and over and over again. A culture of joy. What is a culture of joy? Well, I'm gonna explain that this morning and my three points come from those three, those three letters. Um, but wouldn't you agree with me that joy is something that we need more of? The world needs love, the world needs joy. We live in a world that is drastically and rapidly changing. You don't even have to pay close attention to the news to realize that the world around us is changing and it's changing quickly. The culture of our day has grown more divisive and destructive. 
People are more dissatisfied and discontent. They're unhappy and unfulfilled. They're frustrated. They're fearful. They're worried and they're anxious more than any other time that I've experienced in my life. And I would say that you probably would agree with me. Our culture has become so entitled, so self-centered. People are rude and downright ugly, nasty and mean even happens in the church world. And I'm not talking about our church, but I'm saying in the church world this is happening. People are, are using God and, and coming to church for what they can get for themselves. It pervades our culture. And as we talk about a culture of joy, I think that you would agree with me that people are drawn to someone who is happy and joyful. There is something about being joyful, being happy, that is contagious. Why is it that we love Pastor Courtney on the, on the video announcements? Because she's contagious. And I'm telling you what's different and what, I'm not saying that Pastor Zach or Pastor August don't have Jesus. And <laughs> there's just something about her. But that something could be about all of us. Joy. There's something about that. We probably heard this phrase, laughter is the best medicine. And it, and it absolutely is true. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. The NLT says a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Humor and laughter have a therapeutic effect on your body. Studies have shown that laughing relieves stress. It improves your mood. It reduces tension, and it improves your emotional state. You ever, like, walked up on a conversation and people were laughing? I mean, you walk up and you go, hey, I mean... What's, what, what's so funny? What, I mean, there's just something about it. You hear people laughing about something and it just puts a smile on your face. You know what I'm talking about? We're attracted to that. Laughing has some physical health benefits. It has shown to lower your blood pressure, reduce your pain, relax your muscles, and burns calories. I think maybe we could start a laughing diet. <laughs> How many of you are in for that? <laughs> I have no idea the validity of this, but there is a study and it's telling us that, hey, we just need to laugh more. It's a great weight, weight control program. Laughter just adds joy to your life. And so we want to push back. We want to fight against the prevailing culture of our day any way that we can. And we do that by, by following Jesus. And, and we as followers of Jesus, we serve, we help, we give, we forgive, we love wherever we can. And if we're going to develop a, and nurture a culture of joy right here at New Hope, how do we, how do, we do that? Well, the first thing is this. The J in joy stands for Jesus. It's Jesus, others, and you. You might have heard this before. Maybe you learned it when you were in Sunday school 50 years ago. I don't know. It might sound a little corny. It might be a little cheesy. But here's the deal. The reality of the truth of joy coming by putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. It's, it's important. There's a movement today uh, called I Am Second. Some of you have seen some videos of athletes and uh, stars and musicians who have talked about and shared their testimony of their faith in Jesus and how uh, putting Jesus and others before us uh, is, is key and significant for our lives. They say I'm second. My, my motto in this is I'm third. So I'm trying to, I don't know, market, market some new strategy. I'll just tag onto them. We'll put up our own YouTube videos. I don't, I'm, I'm just, it's not in my notes. <laughs> but let's start with Jesus first. If we're gonna build this culture of joy, we have to put Jesus first in everything that we do. Jesus before anything. Jesus at the center of it all. We sang that song this morning. I don't know if that's new to you, but I think there's so much truth. Jesus, you be the center. You be uh, everything. You're the priority of my life. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The New Living says it like this, seek the kingdom of God above all else. Jesus first, in Christian circles, we may have heard this or you hear it in our preaching or maybe in your conversations with other, with other Christians, but we'll, we'll encourage each other by saying, make sure that Jesus is first. 
Make sure that he has first place in your life. And here's the thing. We all have priorities. We arrange our schedules. We uh, uh, arrange our budgets, our relationships based on what is most important to us. And so putting Jesus, putting God first, means that we give him priority, top priority in everything. He's the principal figure in our life and central to everything that we do and how we think. He is more important. He should be the most, the number one, most important than anyone else. His word more valuable than any other message that's coming into our life. And pursuing his will is our primary, our primary directive. Putting God first means that we keep the greatest commandment. Jesus said the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. One of the Pharisees was trying to trip up Jesus one day, and he asked him this question, teacher, which is the most important of the commandments? And Jesus responded by saying, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the commandments, all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. He's saying it's all summed up in this. Love God and love people. In other words, by putting God first, we're totally invested in a relationship with him. Everything that we have, everything that we are is devoted to him and we hold nothing back. I'm just to ask you this morning, is Jesus first in your life? He needs to be first place, foremost, premier and primary. Nothing goes ahead of him. And we keep our lives free of anything that can become an idol. We don't let anything take God's place as number one. And when I mention idols, a lot of times we think of idols as some little, some little statue uh, of, some, of some false god. But the reality is, according to scripture, anything that we love more than God is an idol. 1 John 5, 21, dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Are you putting Jesus first in your life? I mean, are you really putting Jesus first? Is there anything in your life that you love more than Jesus? Be honest. What are you passionate about? Where's your heart? What motivates you? What provokes you? What your, your interest is? Is Jesus the top of the list? Or is it your job? Or spouse? Or your children or your grandchildren maybe it's your favorite sports team or a hobby listen none of these things none of them are bad at all but they're not worth putting ahead of God if we're going to cultivate joy in our own hearts and in our own families in our own homes in our church then Jesus has to be first Nothing, and don't let anything take the place of Jesus. Those things, those relationships are secondary. They're really temporary. Jesus said this in Luke 14, 26. A lot of the scriptures that I'm going to share, but you may not find up here. So if you've got your notes, take some notes and go back and, and look these scriptures up. But Jesus said this, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate anyone else. Hate if you want to be my disciple. Hate your father and mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Those are tough words. Because just a little while ago, we read the scripture that said, love your neighbor as yourself. And now we're saying, you gotta hate, you gotta hate those people. But listen, the key word is this, where Jesus said, you must, by comparison, he said, you need to love God so much, and he needs to be so much a priority and a first place in your heart and in your life and in your attitude and your actions in every way that the comparison of how you love your mom and dad, how you love your children, it looks like hate. But you don't care about those people? 
You only care about Jesus? It's challenging, but he said, you've got to think that way if you're going to be my disciple. You see, God's the one that created all those things, your people, your family, and he created you. And the real reason that you exist and that you are alive today is Jesus. He's given you the gift of sight. He's given you the gift of hearing. He's given you the capacity to speak, the mental power to think, the reason to choose, and to enjoy the things that you have in life. Listen, but they can't be number one. They can't be first place. Romans eleven thirty six says, for from him and through him and for him are all things. From him, through him, and for him are all things. Everything comes from him and they're intended for his glory. Putting God first in our life means that we do our best to follow in the steps of Jesus. Following in his steps. I've told this story before, but when I lived in Montana and I went hunting with my father-in-law, he knew the mountains, he knew the trails, he knew where to go, he knew what ridge to go on, and I, I, I didn't. But I had him. And what did I do? I followed in his steps. As he's walking through snow, a foot and a half deep, crunching through the snow, he basically made a trail for me, and if I just put my foot in his footsteps, it made it so easy for me. I wasn't forging my own way. I went the easy path, which was to follow the way that he was leading me, which is where I wanted to go in the first place. God is leading you if you'll just follow in his steps. 1 Peter 2, 21, he is your example. You must follow in his steps. Those who put God first, listen, are gonna stand out from the rest of the world. You dare to make Jesus number one in your life, you're gonna stand out. You're gonna look different. You're gonna be different. Those who put Jesus first obey God's command and they take up their cross and they follow Jesus. Those who put God first give God the first fruits and not just the leftovers. And so as a church and as individuals and in our families, let's determine that Jesus is first in all things. And moving forward, that Jesus is always first. Colossians 1.18 says that Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. And it concludes by saying, so he is first. He's first in everything. Jesus first. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Philippians, Paul says, don't do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in, humi in humility, value others above yourselves. So we put Jesus first. Jesus has to be first. And after Jesus comes other people. We, others fall in line after Jesus. There's a passage in the book of Leviticus that spells out our expectations of how we should love our neighbor. Leviticus chapter 19, starting out with verse 9. God gave them this. He said, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields. And do not pick, what the, pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your, with your grape crop. Do not strip the last bunch of grapes from the vines. And do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not bring shame on the name of your God by using it to swear falsely. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear God. I am the Lord. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich or powerful. Always judge people fairly. That would be revolutionary in our day and age. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Don't gossip. Don't stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so that you will not be held guilty for their sin. 
Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this command to love your neighbor goes all the way back to the beginning of the book, and we see the message going all the way through Scripture. God's, God's initiative for us is to put him first in everything that we do. Our love for God must look like hate how we love our, our family and our friends. Premier, first and foremost, God. And after that comes others. We need to put others ahead of ourselves in this passage of Scripture. Loving our neighbors includes sharing with the poor, being compassionate, honesty and justice in our relationships, being impartial, refusing to gossip, or bear a grudge. James calls this the royal law. James 2, 8 says, Indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus gave us this command in Matthew seven twelve: Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you. Listen, if you don't want somebody slapping you in the face, don't slap them. I'm just going to say that. I don't know how many of you slapped somebody this week, but you slap somebody, you're going to get slapped back. Do to others what you want them to do. If you don't want that, don't do that to them. Why can't we just be loving and kind to people? Even if they don't think like we do, if they don't look like we do, if they don't say the same things that we do. Let's love people. We're loving neighbors. Who's my neighbor? We live in a day and age where it seems that offense is as common as breathing. Criticism of other people is rampant. And people feel free to say whatever they want, whenever they want, and they don't care if they offend. And there are a lot of offended people out there. But if we would just love one another as Jesus commanded us so many times. This is what Corinthians says about love. Love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Loving your neighbor means forgiving. Forgiveness is a big deal to God. Listen, every one of us who call ourselves Christians, who are followers of Jesus, we've experienced forgiveness from God. And if we've been forgiven, why would we not extend forgiveness to everybody? Why would we withhold forgiveness when we, our life has been changed, completely changed because of the great debt? There's no way we could get to heaven without God's forgiveness. He's done so much, and he gave so much in order for you to be forgiven. How could you hold unforgiveness against somebody else? Loving your neighbor is forgiving. And he wants us to extend forgiveness to others. Loving your neighbor means acting with compassion. The story of the Good Samaritan, it was the one who had compassion, who was being the neighbor. Listen, compassion isn't warm, fuzzy feelings. Compassion is doing something. Loving your neighbor means looking out for others' well-being. Philippians 2, 4 says, don't look out for your own interests only, but take an interest in others too. To look out for others means that you pay attention, you notice, and then you help. We're not paying attention. There's opportunity all around us. Loving your neighbor means serving them. Serving others from your heart is a, is a is kindness in action. One of the attributes of love is kindness. Love is patient, love is kind. We just read that. Jesus said that he came not to be served, but to serve. Love serves. And if you truly love your neighbor as yourself, then you're gonna serve anyone and everyone. Loving your neighbor means doing tangible things for them. Let them know that you care about them. Leave a note on their door. Send a card in the mail. Those things are huge. Bake them some cookies. If they need a ride somewhere, you drive them. Shovel their drive. It's a whole lot more fun to snow blow. 
If you got a snowblower, snow, snow blow your whole neighborhood. Love your neighbors. But listen, it doesn't, what, what says more is I'm out, if I'm out here shoveling my neighbor's driveway, that's a sacrifice. Love your neighbors. Call or text them just to let them know that you're thinking about them. How many of you have had one of those types of calls before from a friend or, or maybe someone that you weren't even expecting? Hey, that was really nice of you to, to think about me. It's simple, just type a text. There's times that God just drops a, a person in your mind and you, you might be thinking, oh, I'm gonna ask one of the pastors about them. I, I haven't seen them or heard. You know what, why don't you, just, why don't you just send a message? If God's putting somebody on your heart, just call, text. It's an easy thing to do. And it says to somebody, I, I care about you. And hopefully, in your reaching out and encouraging will inspire love inside of them to do the same thing for others. Listen, uh, uh, loving your neighbor is, is praying for them. Pray for people by name. That, it's powerful when you pray for people by name. Don't just tell them that you're going to pray. Pray. And if a neighbor needs God, you've got a, a, a neighbor, a family, pray for them. Last week, Pastor Austin, for those of you that were here, encouraged us to pray, to intercede. And he challenged us to think of somebody in our life, in our family, a coworker, a friend, somebody that, is, that does not know Jesus, and to take the month of February and daily pray for them by name. I don't know how many of you are doing that, but if you weren't here and you didn't get that challenge, I say start today. Today is the 6th of February. You can get most of the days in. And here's what I can say. You praying for them, you may see results, you may not. But how will you know unless you pray? Because you might get to the end of February and say, you know what, not seeing results. I'm going to keep praying for them. And I'm going to pray for them every day. Can I tell you a story? Louise Stromberg shared this with our Wednesday night class. She prayed for her mom who didn't know Jesus. She said, my mom is the worst person, the most mean person I knew. I did not like my mom. And she said, I prayed for my mom for 30 years to know Jesus. And I can't, I don't have time to tell you the miraculous story of what happened in the process of all that. But after 30 years of her praying for her mom every day, her mom called her and said, Louise, I need help to find Jesus. And she was able to lead her mom to the Lord. And she eventually came and lived with her. Her mom came and lived with her at the end of her life. Amazing story. Don't give up. Pray for people. I want to share a story and then I'll get to my last, last point here, but I'm looking out this morning and sitting here with us is a friend of mine named Fergus Taylor. And Ferg and his wife, Nileve, I think it's been probably seven or eight years ago that they first came to New Hope. And Ferg is quite the character. And uh, they're special, special people. Nileve, his wife, passed away about three and a half years ago. But just this past November, December, end, end of November, I can't remember, uh, but Ferg had a stroke. And uh, in the process of everything, found out he has a tumor uh, in, his, in his head. And uh, it is causing some, some difficulties for him to, um, just with his vision and his hearing and speaking and all of that. This is, this is how a church works and how um, family and loving your neighbor is. There are people that, that know Ferg and only know them for the past year and a half since they came. But out of the connection that they made there, this, there's a family. Actually, there's multiple families who have come alongside Ferg. Uh, his son Steve is, is here with him today from the East Coast, and in his absence, not being able to be here, there were people that stepped in and made sure that Ferg is at every day he has radiation, and once a week he has chemo, and a team of people, um, I'm not naming names here, but came in to clean his house multiple times, took care of his dog while he was at the hospital, and uh, helped with groceries and putting things together, getting him to all these appointments. But Ferg, Ferg uh, is a special guy, and I'm just I'm absolutely overwhelmed and amazed at how a church works when his family isn't close, that our church family becomes his family and step in like a surrogate child. And I know Steve, I know, being a son myself, I know that's 
overwhelming. And, and uh, I just want to commend you as a church because all of you can be that way. It's just a matter of taking notice and saying, look, I can do something. But that, that, the sacrifice that's given up time for work, that's given up time for family to help somebody else who is in need. Ferg, we love you and we're praying for you. Ferg, um, with his treatments, has seen some improvement in the tumor and we're working toward that shrinking and, and helping get some things back together. But we love you, Ferg, and we're praying for you. And I just want to say, as a church, you're phenomenal. And I'm talking about a handful of people in that particular situation. There isn't time to share multiple stories. But you're amazing. And thank you so much. This church doesn't... Amen. This church doesn't operate without volunteers, and there are hundreds of volunteers serving in a lot of ways, but that's like outside of this building. It's the way life and family ought to be. Jesus first in everything, others second, and yourself third, last. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus first. Jesus at the center of it all. He's the priority. And he said a second command is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul said this in Romans 12. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So this is the order. Jesus first, others second, yourself third. And if that isn't the order of priority, then it isn't God's way and it won't bring and result in joy. Because if you, you get ahead of things, YJO doesn't spell anything. This is just the illustration of my English acronym here. But in practicality, that's what Jesus is saying. You can't get ahead of the game here. It cannot be about you. It's you putting Jesus first and foremost at the center of everything. And when we put Jesus at the center of everything, guess what? He loves you so much and he loves everybody else so much that he's going to plant thoughts in you and say, you know what, you can do that. Why don't you go, why don't you go help out? Why don't you serve here? Why don't you do that? Really, that's what we're here for. You've got a job. You've got a career. You've, you've got those things. But honestly, that's just a vehicle to help you be a child of God in the places where he's led you to be. Jesus first, others second, yourself Third, you come last of those three. And that doesn't mean you're not important. It doesn't mean that you don't matter. I read a few articles this week on what it means to love yourself, self-love. Uh, because the command says, love your neighbor as yourself. And some people might say, well, that implies that you've got to love yourself before you can love others. And, but the narrative of self-love goes something, somewhere completely different over the top. And I think it, it runs the risk, in my opinion, of putting ourselves first see, Jesus had an order of things. And if he, if he loves you, why wouldn't you love the things that God loves? Hate the things that God hates. And if he loves you that much, you should love yourself. But honestly, if you love Jesus, it's going to cause you to love others. And the end result is you get blessed in the process. Jesus first, others second. And yourself last. This is what scripture says. See how very much the Father loves us. He calls us his children, and that is what we are. First John 3 1. God decided, Ephesians 1 5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. Here's my conclusion if you get the priorities right and you follow God's plan, you're going to experience joy. Jesus taught that to be his disciples, his follower, the spiritual discipline of self, self-denial is required. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Denying yourself means seeking the good of others before looking out for myself. It means being willing to sacrifice my time, my energy, my rights, my position, my reputation, my privileges, my comforts, and even my very life for the sake of Christ. And that will exemplify what it means to deny ourselves. Jesus said these words, whoever finds their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. it brings joy. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. You're in the room or you're 
joining us online this morning, I just want to ask this question simply. Is Jesus the center? Is he the center of it all? Is he premier? Is he first and foremost? Is Jesus first in your life? And as I've been speaking this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit is, is speaking into our lives and saying, is this more important than me in your life? And I just want to just want to make this offer, whether you've never accepted Christ, you've never invited him into your life, or maybe you've followed him your whole life, 30, 40, 50 years. But this morning, you are realizing by the Holy Spirit confirming in your heart, you need to recenter. Because things have got off balance. There's other things that have taken the place of Jesus or have been crowding him out of being the center and being first in your life. And so with every head bowed and eyes closed, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands this morning. Honesty, from the depth of your heart, you would say, Pastor Jeff, today I need, I need to be recentered. I need Jesus to be the center. If you just raise your hand and keep your hand raised. This is just you, between you and God. And you're saying, Jesus, be the center of my life. Lord, I just pray for every hand raised in this room, every person in this room, every person joining online who's raising a hand, saying, Jesus, I need you to take your rightful place in my life. I put you first. Forgive me for allowing things to take your place. Forgive me for making other things more important than you. Thank you for being the center. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Take your rightful place in my life, on the throne of my heart, be my Lord. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask this question. How many this morning you say, I, I have not been paying attention. I've not been sensitive. And there are needs all around me and I've been too selfish. Taking care of my own schedule. Fulfilling my own plans that I haven't even looked or been available. And you would say today, I make a commitment to Jesus to be more attentive, to pay attention, and allow him to speak to me, to love others as myself. Is that you? Just raise your hand. This is it. Raise your hand. Today I'm committed to, to pay attention, to take care of other people stand with me this morning I believe that he wants to nurture a culture of joy among us so contagious and if we would just love Jesus first others second he's going to take care of you like you can't even imagine and there's going to be something so contagious. Listen, it already, it already is happening here. I have people that are new walk in and say, it seems like everybody knows everybody here. And you all know that's not true. You don't know everybody. But it sure seems like that to someone walking in. What they're saying is, people love each other here. But here's what we need to do. We need to take that love outside and let, let the world see Jesus. Take it outside. This is, what, this is what Jesus said. You're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. Let your light shine before men so that they might see your good deeds, not so that you can say, look how great we are. He says, so they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's all about Jesus. It always brings people back to Jesus. I want to sing this song. It's just a commitment song. We sang it earlier. But would you sing this with me with all your heart? Jesus, be the sender of my life. Jesus is what it's all about. It's got to be him and him alone. There's nothing that can satisfy or take his place in your life. You will stumble and fall and struggle and struggle if he's not centered in your life. I believe that with all of my heart. You were designed and created by him. He knows, he knows how to get the most. He wrote the instruction manual. He knows how you work. And he knows that if you put him first and you care about others, you're going to be so fulfilled. You're going to be so who he wants you to be. You don't have to worry about it all. Aren't you glad? For Jesus. Let's 
cultivate this culture of joy by putting Jesus first, taking care and looking after others, and know that he's going to take care of us. However, he can do it, and it's best. If you're not a part of a class, I encourage you to be in a class. There's several classes coming up right after this, the 11 o'clock hour. God bless you. Remember our business meeting today at 4. I encourage all of you to come. It'll be a tremendous time. We start with communion and worship right at 4. Business will begin about 4.15. But I hope that you'll make it back to this afternoon at 4. God bless you. Have a great day.